there because in 1 Peter we're going to look at a lot of verses throughout this letter. Peter talks about salvation in this past tense as being something that predates even man himself really. And starting in verse 10, he talks about of this salvation, and we'll see more about that salvation as we read uh, throughout the lesson. But of the salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was real that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering, the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. These things that have been laid forth and laid down, this this pattern and this path, this gospel message was something that was in the mind of God long before even man was created. And when man first sinned in the garden and hid himself from the presence of God, God had already begun his work of how he was going to redeem man back to himself. And thousands of years ago, before any of us were born, a man named Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, came, lived, died, was buried, was resurrected because he was the Son of God to provide for us salvation. So that night on September 13th, 1990, when I was saved, it was because of all those things that God had put in place just for that moment of time. Now how special is that? And how important and meaningful is that? And tonight might be that night for you that all these things have been put in place. From the dawning of time, God has seen fit to make it just as easy as he possibly can for you to come to him so that you might have a moment of time when it is talking about this idea of was saved, was delivered. These words are pointing to a specific point of time in which these things took place. We know that it was because of the blood of Christ that it was brought to us to begin with. In verse 18 of that same chapter, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope or in God. Prior to those moments, it was a a time of hearing about who Jesus was and what he did. It was a time of knowing that these things were done for me, that I might have salvation. And it was done because God loved me so much. And to go back and remember what it was like, that what, what was it that first attracted me to hearing that message? What was it that first convicted me of knowing that that message was really meant for me? That that message was one that was for the salvation of my soul and reconnecting with that. That's why it's important to be able to look back and say that I was saved and know when that took place, why it took place, and how it took place. In chapter 2 and verse 24, it says very explicitly that who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. When Jesus Christ was being beaten... Thousands of years before I was born, he was being beaten for the sins that I would commit and that I might have the chance of forgiveness. When he spilt that blood, it was for me before I was ever even born. It was put in place long before September 13, 1990. And that's a very important prospect to know that these things were done for everyone and not just a few individuals. I took advantage of that. As Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 22 and 23, he points to the past tense by telling them, since you have purified, this was something that was done, you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another uh, fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. There's great confidence that Peter gives in that statement when he talks about this word of God. Precious was the blood of Christ that was spilled earlier in this chapter. But here again, he talks about how precious and how beautiful the word is that you obeyed. And when you obeyed that word, it lives and abides forever. Just as it was that these things were in the mind of God before time began and nothing that Satan could do could stop it. He put in place a scheme even when man first sinned and nothing Satan could do 
could stop it. No matter how evil and vile men became, God's plan was still working. And even when Jesus came upon the face of the earth, Satan and man could not stop it. And Jesus paid the price. And I can have just as much assurance that just as sure as God made it positively without a fact, without any kind of contradiction, that for a fact I can be saved, I can stay saved. Because the word lives and abides forever. That same word that saved me is still that same word that I receive with meekness. It's the same word that I study. And it's the same word that I strive to live by each and every day. So in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter says this. He says, there's an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What happened on September 13th, 1990 was I was baptized. I was baptized for the, for the remission of my sins because I believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That everything I had heard, everything that I had studied, everything that I knew about him screamed of the fact that I was a sinner and pled for me to be forgiven. That's what salvation was offered, the salvation that was offered. And that's the salvation that was accepted. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. Think of the past, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, to not be deceived, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, Drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were, past tense, washed. You were, past tense, sanctified. You were, past tense, justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. The hope of the gospel is this, is that whoever you were in the past, you don't have to continue to be. Whatever that phrase, whatever that name was that was given to you, whatever that label is that was attached to you in the past, that doesn't have to follow with you. That's who you were. It's not going to be who you are. And it's not, by the grace and mercy of God, who you will be. Because that's what God's deliverance brings to you. Hebrews 9 and verse 14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works that you might serve the living God so that you can come to God in full assurance knowing that I will be saved and from that point on, I'm no longer who I was and I can serve God in all good conscience. What a blessing indeed that would be. So let's talk about the present. How it is that I am now saved. If you go back to 1 Peter and let's notice several passages from 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because when we think about being saved in the present tense, there's a lot of obligations that go along with that. Because of what God has done for us, that Jesus died for us, we have all died as well. And the life we live, we are to live toward him. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 1, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire, this is what we're supposed to be doing, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Since you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, then desire that pure milk so that you may grow. And then Peter's going to talk about several things in which we can know that we are growing in areas in which we are to grow. And notice how astounding, how challenging several of these areas are. Skip down to verses 9 and 10 that we're a chosen generation and a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. We had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. And so in verse 11, we are sojourners and pilgrims. And so as we're wandering through this land that we're living in, that we're no longer uh, citizens of, and that we're strangers among these people that we're walking, he says, have your conduct honorable among them in verse 12. Verses 13 through 17, he talks about dealing with the government and the things and these rulers that may from time to time oppress us and be against us. And brethren, we all know how it is that sometimes we have rulers that are in place that the only reason 
that we can treat them with any kind of respect whatsoever is not because of who they are, but just because our God has demanded it of us. And that's enough for us. Because he's not my king. He's not my ruler. Christ is. And so I treat myself, I conduct myself with honor among the people. Verse 18 and following, being submissive, just as it is that I may find myself as a slave working for a master who is evil and may beat me when I don't deserve it. And when I take it patiently, Peter says, you're just like Christ. And that's enough. That wives are talked about in chapter 3 and verse 1 about being submissive to their own husbands and how that may be a difficult task. But Peter says that even if you conduct yourself the way that the faithful women of old did, you can win an unbelieving husband without even speaking a word. That husbands are reminded that you're to dwell with your wives with understanding because if you don't seek to understand them, God's not going to listen to your prayers. So be submissive. Finally, verse 8 of chapter 3, be of one mind and have compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. There's going to be times in verse 16 where there's going to be people that will defame you as evildoers and revile your good conduct in Christ. But these are the kinds of people that will be ashamed when they see your good conduct and your ability to answer with meekness. Verse 18 of chapter 3, Christ also suffered and it makes us like him when we follow in suit. He goes into chapter 4 and talking about verse 1, arming yourselves also with the same mind. What all of this is about, and when we're talking about this present salvation and salvation in the present, it's about shaping our character. We have been redeemed from the man that we were. The old man of sin has been crucified and he has been put to death. We are no longer that person, but who are we now? Who are we to be? We're to be shaped in the image of Christ, but that doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen just because you were baptized. But that shaping of character, that's more along the lines not of justification, but of sanctification. You've been set aside for something. You've been separated from the penalty of sin when you obeyed the gospel. But now you've been set aside to the purposes of God in the life that you live. So arm yourself with this mind. It, it, it's the idea of taking up an armament. It's the idea of, of taking up weapons of your defense and your, your uh, waging of your battle. Arm yourselves with this mind so that whenever you face whatever the situation is, you know what you're supposed to do because you are saved. You don't have to worry what the rulers may do to you. You don't have to worry what an untoward spouse may do. You don't have to worry about what a master may do. You don't have to worry what the enemy does because you are safe. You're saved. You are saved because you're striving and you're growing. And with each thing that happens, doesn't it cause you to desire the pure milk of the word that much more? Doesn't it make you that much thirstier so that you can come to the well from which Jesus Christ brings the water of life and drink freely from it. And how refreshing it is that it makes moments like this so very special. We are saved. Brethren, you're saved. Why does the world get us? We're saved. Why are we troubled? We are saved. That's confidence and that gives us hope as we'll see even in a moment. In verse 7 of chapter 4, the end of all things is at hand. So therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And be hospitable, in verse 9. Spend time with one another. Verse 12, don't think it's strange when trials come upon you. These are the same kinds of things, he says, that happen to others in the world, your other brethren. But if you suffer as a Christian, in verse 16, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in that name that you wear and that you suffer for. Because judgment's going to begin. And it's going to begin with us. So where are they going to be? That's a terrifying thing. Paul says it this way in Philippians 3 and verse 13. When he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He forgot the things that were past that he could have counted as being good. 
and he laid hold on Jesus Christ and him alone. John said it this way in 1 John 5 verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. It's interesting that John uses the same type of language in chapter 1 and verse 4 when he says, These things I've written to you that your joy may be full. It's very interesting to me because we talk a lot about chapter 5 and verse 13 about knowing that you are saved. And that's something that many struggle with over time, knowing that we are saved at this particular moment of time, knowing that we are saved. And John himself does relate it back to in chapter 1 verse 4, having a joy that's full. That's why these things were written. How can your joy be full if you don't know that you're saved? So John writes for that purpose, that we might know it. And brethren, we will be saved. When the Lord returns, when the heavens are rolled back, when the names are read from the book, to know that we'll be ushered into a heavenly kingdom is that thing that we're striving for with anticipation. This future... And the idea of thinking about what's coming is what gives us hope. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. And really this is how Peter started. He does it in reverse order. He talks more about the future, then the present, then the past. 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, are cut, or who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There we have things from the past. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept, here we have present tense again, kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, and here future tense, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you, you're grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Peter uses some very uh, beautiful words to talk about being ready for that day to come and how it is that we have an anticipation of that and knowing that when Jesus comes again, all the things that we've been looking forward to, all these things that have been uh, assaulting our faith, have been working for us something. He talks about being grieved by the various trials and how gold has this dross within it. That is, it's, When the fire is hot, that dross gets removed from the gold so that it is found to be purified and ready for the use of the one who purifies it. To them it has been, First Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Remember we talked about why do we live the way that we live in front of them? Why do we, how do we find strength to live that way among the unbelievers? It's because we are saved but know this, that in the end, there's a day of visitation coming. This day of visitation is when God shows up to say, what happened? How did you treat my servants? This day of visitation is a day of examination. We're talking about the day of judgment, where God is going to make all be revealed. And it's going to be found that we conducted ourselves with honor, though we may have been speed, uh, treated spitefully by those others. We're also told in chapter 4, in verse 13, again, the sufferings, don't think it's strange, verse 12 that we read a moment ago, verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. It's not only because, brethren, we know we are saved, but because we know we will be saved in the end. Chapter 5 and verse 4, once again, Chapter 5 and verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It's a blessing to be able to serve God's people. But there are ways in which God expects us to serve that God himself is going to reward openly when that day happens. 1 John 2 and verse 28, John says it this way. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence 
and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Again, Romans 5, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. It, it gives us so much more meaning and so many more reasons to live faithfully each and every day knowing that God has in the past done so much that we might be saved and that we might live each moment of our life with the full acknowledgement, the full confidence that I am saved. I am one of God's people. He sees me. He hears me. He knows what I am going through. And I can make it through this because I am saved and I will be saved. God does not ignore these things and God is going to revisit these things. And I am going to be with him throughout all eternity. So the light affliction of the moment is working for us a far more exceeding and abundant glory when that day happens. One thing I would encourage you to do, brethren, is when you're going through the, the New Testament letters, the epistles especially, pay attention to how many times the authors will refer to the past, the things of the present, and the things of the future, and using those to give us hope and confidence and to instill within us greater faith. And I believe you'll be rewarded by it. This greatly rewarded me this week, and I think it will you as well. God bless you as you walk through this life. Because God has blessed you, God is blessing you, and God will continue to bless you because you are his people. And so tonight, the questions, I'm just going to leave with you three questions, and that is, have you been saved? Is there a point of time where you can look back and say, at that moment I was delivered from my sins? Are you saved? Are you walking with him? Do you have faith and confidence as you walk each day? And do you know that when the Lord comes back that you're going to be one of his and you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. If you have doubt, if there's things that need to be corrected, if there's something that we can do to help, that's what we're here for. Maybe this lesson has seemed five hours and 45 minutes long. And if that's the case, I apologize and wish you had got up five hours and 43 minutes ago. <laughs> because if you're ready to be saved, we're ready to help. If we can in any way, won't you please come as together we stand and sing this song.